Hi everyone, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Like Bron said, I'm Jess, um, I'm a social worker and for the last four and a half years I've been working with people seeking asylum and other vulnerable migrants for the Red Cross. I really love being a part of this humanitarian movement that supports people seeking asylum um, because I genuinely believe that everyone has a right to find safety in another country and to be treated with respect and dignity during their journey. That wasn't always the case for me. For a really long time I didn't know about the world of asylum seekers or refugees. My world was mainly the western suburbs of Sydney and I was more concerned about what I was going to do on a Friday night. Um, after I graduated my first degree, which was a psychology degree, I had no career path, no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't even too fussed about what I was going to do. Um, but more importantly, I didn't know what my values were and I didn't know what I stood for. So I did what every good young Aussie does when they're in that confused state. I took off to London and I travelled through Europe and basically I just had a really fun time. I didn't really do much any at all. After a couple of years, I came back to Sydney and I wanted to get serious about developing skills that would help me help other people appropriately. So I enrolled in a social work degree. Part of that social work degree is that you need to complete a student placement with an organisation. I'd heard that Red Cross worked with uh, refugees and I was really adamant that that's where I wanted to do my student placement. Now looking back on that time, I cannot tell you why I really wanted to work with refugees and specifically at Red Cross, I honestly cannot remember. Um, but I'm really glad I did and I'm really glad I got approved to, to do my placement there. Um, the first time I sat in a little Red Cross meeting room across, across from a man seeking protection in Australia was one of the most humbling and life-changing experiences ever. A uh, switch went off in my little brain. I was learning all this information, learning all these new facts. I was learning about different cultures. And I was also hearing stories about people's lives that I genuinely didn't think happened to other human beings. And it became very clear that there are groups of people in this world who are unable to live in the country that they are born in due to fear of persecution because of who they are, what they believe in, or because of conflict going on around them. So people make the decision to leave and they might find themselves here in our country and this is where the Australian Red Cross steps in. When people come to our office, we don't ask them why they're here or what they're fleeing or what their story is. We ask them, what do you need? Do you have any community support here? And what do you like doing? So I wanna paint a picture of what my colleagues and I do on a day-to-day -day basis through a case study. It was the first family I supported when I eventually became a fully fledged and paid caseworker. Um, it was a family from Iran with two boys and they travelled by boat to Australia. They'd spent some time in detention centres and were eventually settled in Parramatta. They were, giving, they were given a bridging visa to live in, in the community while they were waiting to find out if the government was going to grant them refugee status, which meant permanent residency. At that period of time, uh, bridging visas didn't have work rights, so they were reliant on Centrelink payments, which is about 89% of the New Start allowance. Um, before I go on, I want, I want you to imagine that someone has plucked you from your seat right now and has dropped you in the middle of Afghanistan. And you know you're going to be there for a little while and you've got a lot of stuff to sort out. You need to find out where to live, you need to find out how people go about finding out where to live. You need to find out where the doctor is, how you're going to get money. And while you're doing all that, you need to learn another language as well. And so that's where we started with this family. We started with helping them with what they needed. We helped them find a rental property and that involved explaining how to do that in Sydney. You go online, you fill in an application form, you go to the inspections and yes, it's really stressful and annoying. Uh, we helped them get Medicare card, uh, explain what bulk billing was, connected them with a GP, uh, Persian speaking GP and also torture and trauma counsellors. We linked them with English classes and the two boys enrolled in intensive English uh, centre high schools. The oldest boy picked up English really quickly, which is common for, um, and became, sorry, and he became the translator and spokesperson for the family. 
which is really common for um, young people of refugee families. He loved school and he dreamed of going to university and becoming a mechanical engineer. While the youngest son was into dancing and uh, singing and swimming and he was always entertaining people in reception, uh, so we connected him with some classes for that as well. Uh, the whole family was determined to make a meaningful life for themselves and contribute uh, to the community wherever possible. And we have a few clients uh, through Red Cross that actually donate blood because it's one of the few ways where you don't need fluent English or some spare cash to give back. So while the family was doing all this, trying to make some sort of new life for themselves, they still were waiting to find out if they were going to be able to stay. So, and I wish I had a happy ending to tell you about this story. Um, the family eventually moved to another organisation, so I lost touch with them. Um, but it is fairly certain to say that they're probably still waiting to find out about the decision of their visa. Um, so that means they've been waiting for about four years now. There are many stories in Australia, similar yet unique in their own right to this family that I just mentioned, and there's millions more across the globe. The asylum seeker and refugee social issue is, it's huge. And when a problem is that big, it's really easy to feel overwhelmed and feel very powerless to make any sort of positive change. Um, but I have to tell you, as an individual, you can. We can all be part of changing the conversations around people seeking asylum. You might not see direct results when you do it or get that instant uh, feel-good rush, um, but you'll be part of a collective voice that is saying, refugees and asylum seekers are people too. So I'm going to break that down for you, how you to do it, into three easy steps. <laughs> oh, thanks, Bron. So the first is, is know the facts. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of myths and a lot of untruths that go around in the media. And if you're armed with the right knowledge, it makes the conversations um, a lot more easier. Uh, Refugee Council of Australia and Red Cross's uh, 13 Things You Should Know are really great resources and a really great starting point. Number two is be brave to have the conversations because they're not always easy to have and they usually pop up at times when you're socialising or just trying to have a good time. Um, everyone has an opinion on this issue but I think it's really important that we um, be brave enough to have the, have the conversations when they arise. And number three is how do you want to help? So figure out what helping means to you, what your values are, what piece of the puzzle do you want to be? So for me, I really enjoy working directly with people. I really enjoy being part of a big organisation like Red Cross. And the Red Cross principles of uh, neutrality and humanity uh, really appeal to me. For some people, they, um, for some people they enjoy protesting, lobbying to governments, or being part of organisations like Amnesty International. For other people, they enjoy working directly with communities or being a part of local-based um, local community charities. In the sector at the moment, it's um, the Asylum Seeker Centre in Newtown, House of Welcome and Jesuit Refugee Service out in the western suburbs. Some people like donating their time and their skills to enhance people's lives, and some people like to just give straight up cash and material aid donations, which I have to tell you is very needed right now, um, particularly in the emergency relief space where I work. There is a large number of uh, people seeking asylum who will be without access to work rights and without access to welfare support and will be completely reliant on charity donations. None is better than the other. They are all important and they are all necessary to create social change. So I want to finish up with a quick story and I think it's a really funny story so please laugh at the end of it. <laughs> so I had been working with this young Hazara man. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Hazara group is an ethnic group in Pakistan and Afghanistan who are persecuted, oh sorry, who are not recognised by their government and are actively persecuted. So I had been advocating to Centrelink to get him back onto his payments after he lost his job and uh, found out that he got approved. So I gave him a call and I was like, hey, it's really good news. You're on the program again. You got your Centrelink money again. You just have to go to the Centrelink appoint appointment. And I did my whole big caseworker spiel. 
and he let me go on for about 10 minutes and he stops me and he goes, Jessica, I went to the Centrelink appointment today and I have to give you some context before I carry on because we were really, really busy at that time and I was a little bit stressed. And I said to him, I was like, I was like, what? I was like, who told you to go to Centrelink today? And he goes, you did. So at this time I'm on the phone and I'm scrolling through my case notes on the computer um, and we had had this exact same conversation a week earlier. I had basically repeated the entire piece of work that I needed to do. He had already knew all this. And he says to me, he's like, did you request another Centrelink appointment for me? And I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> and he just starts laughing and I start laughing. And for a couple of minutes, we both just lose the plot over the phone. And I said to him like, Ahmed, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I think I need a holiday. And he goes, Jessica, yeah, I think you do. You should come to Auburn with us and have kebabs. <laughs> and it's my favorite example of humanity in action because for a brief moment, I wasn't his caseworker. He wasn't an asylum seeker. Uh, we were just two people having the most ridiculous conversation. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>